My theme in this series, Music, Imagination and Experience in the Medieval World, is uh, to chant in a veil of tears. That's my theme today. Now, it's often been said, hasn't it, that the Middle Ages was really one age, the age of faith, of the great cathedrals, of the Crusades, which you might think of rather come back to haunt us in recent years with problems in the Middle East. We imagine perhaps monks, nuns and clergy bent over those tightly written Bibles that some of us have seen under glass perhaps, maybe even handled or seen reproduced in a book. But these same men and women spent as much time and perhaps more time singing their Bibles than reading them. Now this they did as you can imagine, in various forms of chant or psalmody, if you prefer, for the mass and office using words that were adapted from Scripture. <coughs> this means that many passages of the Bible were associated with a particular curve of melody, as surely as the words Dominus Fabiscum are associated with a particular curve of melody. For anybody who knows the Latin rite as it survives now, so although the page of that medieval Bible, seen under glass, reproduced in a book, may seem a very silent thing, for a medieval eye, for a medieval inner ear, if you like, there was a glimmer of melody around a great deal of the text because they had sung it hour after hour, day after day, week by week, month after month, year after year for a life. Well, that experience, as you can imagine, showed the medieval singer that music sometimes carried the divine word to a deeper depth in the listener, to a greater depth in the listener, than the speaking voice could do alone. And more deeply even than a passionate sermon or an erudite commentary. One of the <coughs> strange things about being a medievalist by profession is that medievalists know about all sorts of people who were famous for a thousand years, but whose names are now virtually unknown. Let me introduce you to one of them. Bishop Isidore of Seville is someone who really only specialists tend to have heard of now. But a book which he compiled, entitled The Etymologies, was right, widely read for a millennium. Much of its material was still available, for example, in translation to Shakespeare in the uh, encyclopedia that Shakespeare consulted the, on the properties of things. Now, Isidore died in the year 636, Isidore of Seville, and as his name indicates, he lived in what was then Visigothic Spain, a kingdom which was, I think, still in many respects, a very, very late Roman Spain, on the verge, of course, of becoming an Islamic Spain at the time he wrote. Now, Isidore heard readers and singers at work in his cathedral every day when he was in residence. And he believed that readers had the power to announce, that's his word, announce the teachings of Scripture to the people, to announce them. But singers, singers could excite the minds of their hearers to compunction. I'll come back to that word. For the moment, I think, it's enough to register that it means a sharp pain. It's related, of course, to the word puncture. And as you remember from childhood, or for all I know, from more recent events, a sharp pain can bring tears to the eyes. And my theme today is to chant in a veil of tears. Now, an educated citizen of ancient Rome was quite free to regard musicians as no better than slaves, which of course many of them were. But Christian monks and clergy were not. No bishop, no abbot, no abbess could afford to neglect the acknowledged power of music to move, nor could they forget, so to speak, God's own sponsorship of that art in heaven. They inherited through the book of Revelation to look no further the concept of paradise as an end-time temple where men and angels sang in perpetual ecstasy. So death was the portal to eternal symphony in heaven, 
or everlasting stridency in hell. The blessed, it was believed, as many still believe, would certainly sing in heaven with the angels. And if you heard my second lecture in this series, you may remember that on some occasions it was believed to be possible to actually overhear the angels doing it, singing in concert with their earthly counterparts. As the earthly singers came to an end, the resonance of the angelic voices could just be caught like a lingering or glittering harmonic in the space of the church. Now the question of how music moved the listener seemed a pressing one to many in the Middle Ages, not only because the effects could be so powerful, indeed overpowering, but also because there was, as isn't there, there still is, something deeply mysterious in music's effects and therefore beyond regulation, beyond control. You could say that to recognize, as Isidore of Seville did, that music can evoke a deep feeling of piety in those who find themselves unmoved or less moved by the words of Scripture alone when read, to acknowledge that is to acknowledge a challenge to the supremacy of the rational powers embodied in language and grammar, the supremacy, if you like, of the word. And it was Augustine in his church in fourth century northern Africa who said that music is most deeply expressive of the joy of heaven, when in fact there aren't any words at all, as when you sing, for example, the last syllable of the word Alleluia and prolong it. There is no text anymore. And that is what Augustine thinks most uh, expresses the joy of heaven, and there is no text. Well, my title, To Chant in a Vale of Tears, alludes to one of the most famous of all medieval Latin plain songs, the Salve Regina. You have a copy of the uh, music in square notation, in a form of medieval notation, on the first page of your handout. It is, of course, one of the great expressions of penitential piety of the Middle Ages. And you have the translation on the second page. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, Hail our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this veil of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy toward us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. Ad nos convers. 
Well, with that chant in our ears, so inviting, don't you think, to an affective performance, one emphasizing feeling with its rhetorical and sighing address, O oh, Clement, O oh, loving, O oh, Virgin Mary. We can well understand, I think, why medieval writings contain many observations about the power of particular chants to seem redolent of certain emotional states, even though, I would argue, medieval singers uh, sang in the choir but didn't exactly perform, and even though they heard but did not exactly listen. On the whole, their comments about the effects the emotional effects of chant are actually quite reassuring, it seems to me, because they don't try finally to resolve the question of what's actually happening when we're moved by music to tears or anything else. Well, modern researchers, as I'm sure many of you know, in contrast, have really been much more dogged. And there's now a large body of research devoted to the mystery of human responses to music, and especially to the subject of music and emotion that's gathered uh, momentum, I think, with contributions by specialists in neurology and psychoacoustics, the scientific study of how the brain and perception responds to sound. Much of this work, as you can imagine, is really very stimulating and cross-disciplinary, especially if you believe, as many now seem to, that magnetic resonance imaging of the brain, or MRI, will eventually have a great deal to reveal in the coming years about what's happening in the brain when music affects you. But though it's very interesting research, very little of it is historical. And therefore, it seems to me, that's one of the reasons why I'm addressing you on this today, it seems to me the time is ripe for thinking about emotion and musical response in a historical way, indeed in relation to the Middle Ages. Now, we know very little about the ways in which men and women destined to become singers of the liturgy were socialized in the early years of their life, or, for example, how their emotions were formed by interaction with their parents or by play. I'm sure many of you know there's been a debate for many years as to what exact sense of childhood people in the Middle Ages, Renaissance, and even early modern Europe, what sense of childhood they actually had, as opposed to the notion that a child is a small adult waiting to happen. The idea that there's a distinctive domain of childhood with certain qualities, with certain summons to one's compassion, uh, to one's need to discipline, and so on, that has been debated uh, quite a good deal. How, what sense of childhood did people have? And as for play, if you look into the field of medieval toy studies, you'll find it's very quickly traversed. We know very little about the formation of children through their play and their games. All one can say is, of course, once singers did uh, take on the various forms of life they'd chosen, or which were chosen for them, and began the business of learning, the arduous business, hour after hour of learning, to sing their chant, they were neither musicians, as we might immediately understand the term now, nor an audience. As I said a moment ago, and I repeat it, they sang but did not exactly perform, they heard but did not exactly listen. Nor exactly did they really have composers. The term Gregorian chant, which we all know, we've all heard it, associates a good deal of the very oldest layers of plain song, going back to at least the 8th century, with a, a pope named Gregory, taken in the Middle Ages to be Gregory the Great, Gregory I, who died in 604. But even the most determined admirers of Gregory in the Middle Ages, and there were many of them, as you can imagine, he was, after all, a great writer, apart from anything else, saw him as a divinely inspired maker, editor, and redactor of chant, not as a fountainhead or composer in the sense that might be most familiar to us for the whole repertoire. 
And when monks and clerics began to compose new chants for local saints, for the saint round the corner, so to speak, as opposed to the universal saints like Mary Magdalen or St. Nicholas, when they did that, they often attributed the Gregorian music to anonymous old masters in the plural and regarded themselves as the moderns, the moderni. So for the most part, chant really doesn't have a strong sense of a composer, and it's easy to demonstrate that when a particular bishop, for example, did compose all the music for an office, even in his own church it could be forgotten within as little as 30 years that he had composed it, and it began to be attributed to others or attributed to nobody. Well, I'd like now to introduce you to another figure, utterly obscure, except to medievalists, I think, and I introduce you to him because he really is one of the most interesting and articulate commentators on chant from the Middle Ages. He's known to us only as John. And he was a monk writing in a corner of what's now Belgium, uh, to be precise, what's now Flemish Brabant, at the monastery of Afliken, which still exists. It's been refounded. Indeed, I've been there. He gives his opinion on various chants and their effects, but he knows that there are no simple answers. He even describes how he himself sang some chants to a group of listeners, and what some greatly approved, others found simply distasteful. They didn't like it. One of the plain songs he discusses is the antiphon Rex Altem David. And I'd like to dwell on that to try and get into John's head, if you like, into John's ear. The text is based on David's lament uh, for his third son, Absalom, as recounted in the second book of Samuel. And according to John, this chant, and I quote him, seems to make lamentation audible, not only in the words, but also in the chant to make lamentation audible. What an intriguing remark that is over the centuries. This man was writing, I remind you, around about 1100. Well, you have the text on your handout, and I'll explain the curious layout of it in a moment. Rex autem David, cooperto capite incedens, lugebat filium dicens, Absalom fidimi, fidimi Absalom, Quis mihidet ut ergo moriar pro te, filimi Absalom. And you have the translation. King David, walking with covered head, mourned for his son, saying, O Absalom, my son, O my son, Absalom, who may grant me that I may die for thee, O my son, Absalom. As you can see, there's a brief narrative introduction. King David, walking with covered head, mourned for his son, saying, and then the text becomes a soliloquy by David as he expresses his grief for the loss of Absalom. Here's the chant. might we begin to understand what John means by saying that that chant, of course, I can't be entirely sure it's exactly the melody he knew, but that particular melody was very, very widely circulated indeed. How can we work towards what he means by saying it makes lamentation audible? Well, you could make a start 
with the Latin text, which I invite you to glance at again just briefly. Given that it is very short, it is, don't you think, notably rhetorical. And I've mapped some of the more obvious features on the handout for you to make them absolutely plain. There are repetitions, as if to evoke the obsessive circling around the source of grief, as when one says, and I'm sure we've all said it, oh, why, why, why? Here it's, fili me, fili me, Absalom, fili me, Absalom. There's also, of course, a bitterly rhetorical question. Who may grant me that I die for thee? Of course, nobody can. There's sound patterning, alliteration, cooperto capite. And there's internal assonance, incidence, decens. And you've perhaps already spotted the rather striking chiasmus, the A, B, B, A structure. Absalom, fili me, fili me, Absalom. All of this, I think, is designed to suggest powerful feeling. A speech circles around the core of grief without finding release. And as, let's say, emotion creates eddies and patterns of sound in what's being said. Now for the music. Medieval singers classified their chants with great articulacy and, it seems to me, synthesizing intelligence into eight modes, they've called them modes or tones, I'll call them modes. You can think of a mode as an eight-note scale, using the white, with one exception, which we don't have to bother, an eight-note scale using the white notes of your piano, and starting at certain particular points. But that really doesn't explain what a mode is, except in the most rudimentary way. A mode is actually a notion of what the materials of that scale can be made to do. How you can find patterns of weight, patterns of repose, patterns of movement and so on within the sequence of tones. Now John, we're still with John, ascribes particular characters to the eight modes. And the mode of the chant you've just heard, which incidentally is mode six, he says, is inherently doleful. Here now, Chris is just going to la la, as if in a singing exercise, that mode, mode six, considered just as a scale. Well, I think you'll agree that doesn't sound desperately doleful. It's in fact a straight major scale. And indeed, you may have thought that you were momentarily transposed into a dressing room where Chris is rehearsing for Rigoletto. It is simply a, a major scale, or that's how we hear it. That's because we're hearing it wrong. For John, the main structural pitch of that scale is actually four steps up the ladder. And I'm going to ask Chris to sing it again, but pausing on that structural note. I think that's already starting to sound a little bit different. And now I'm going to ask Chris to add a pause on another important note in chants of this mode. I think we're beginning to hear, I hope you are, how a mode is really about the meaning of musical patterns and the weight assigned to certain tones. What started out as a major scale is starting to sound a little bit different. Indeed, chants of the mode we're considering often show a tendency to have long falling phrases that wind their way down, as if pulled down by weight, want of energy, want of zest. Try this musical phrase and hear how it falls to its low point. That 
That's actually an extract from the chant that you just heard, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. The curious appearance of the Latin text on your handout, all broken up like that, is designed to show the way the music articulates the grammatical sense and the structure, the rhetorical structure. And you can see how carefully the music does follow that structure, laying the text out according to significant moments of musical sense and pause, produces a no hiatus in the un outflow of the syntax of the text at all. And you'll hear that, because I'm going to ask, obviously, Chris to sing that chant complete for us again in a moment. And here's another thing. You'll notice when Chris sings it the second time that the melody cunningly rises to its peak on the word lugebat, meaning he lamented, and never touches that point again. It's a deliberate, strategic moment designed to draw attention to an affective word, he lamented. And it also leaps to get there. The only time in this chant where grief lends, if not energy, then at least a desperate insistence to the music. Rex autem David, coperto capite in genes, lugebat fidium dices, absalon fidi. There's one term very often used by medieval writers to describe a strong emotional reaction to chant. I've already told you what it is. It's compunctio or compunction. The words related, as you can see, through its Latin parent to modern English, well, point, puncture, pungent, poignant, and of course, compunction. The literal meaning is of a pricking or stinging sensation, as if someone were to, as if you sit on a drawing pin, for example, something like that. So it, it's sharply physical, ultimately, and carries a reminder of being in the body. And that was one of the themes of my lecture series this, this season, was singing in the body, the stations of the breath. Now, the clergy and those living a common life in the Middle Ages, notably monks and nuns, built their sense, didn't they, of existence, their sense of what they were doing, of who they were, upon the consequences of Adam and Eve's transgression, the fall, which, to adapt the words of John Donne, was their sin, though it were done before. You may remember the John Donne poem, Wilt thou forgive the sin where I begun, which was my sin, though it were done before. In other words, it was done before even I was born, but yet it is my sin because it is visited, visited upon me as a descendant of our first parents. The performance of plain song certainly could induce sudden moments of emotion when singers felt their sinfulness, their fallen nature, like a sharp prick of conscience with exceptional force, and compunction was the name for that, and it's the term they repeatedly use. Chief among its manifestations was a flow of tears which you'll remember from the Salve Regina in Hac Lacrimarum Valle, in this veil of tears. Now, perhaps that shouldn't surprise us. Nietzsche, I think this is the first time I've ever referred to him in these lectures, it may be the last. Nietzsche once declared that he could not differentiate between tears and music. 
And one influential writer on lacrimose emotions, because the gift of tears, of course, is something that Catholics have always acknowledged and still do, quotes that remark from Nietzsche and adds, perhaps a little dogmatically, anyone not immediately struck by the profundity of Nietzsche's statement has not lived for a minute in the intimacy of music. Well, I don't think the matter's quite so clear, and I stand rather with Tennyson. Tears, idle tears, I know not what they mean. The meaning of tears, it seems to me, in any state of civilization has to be assessed. It cannot simply be assumed. C tears are coded in very, very different ways. Notice the difference, for example, in the coding of male tears, a man's tears, between now and the 12th century when in a great epic poem like the Song of Roland, 5,000 Frankish warriors burst into tears all at the same moment. I'd like to consider two passages in which living in the intimacy of music inspires a tearful response. Now, they were written a thousand years apart, one from the 9th century, one from the 19th. The first is by a Frankish singer named Grimlike, who served as a cantor or soloist in the Abbey of St. Arnulf in Metz. His memory was honored at the famous island abbey of Reichenau in Lake Constance, I suspect because he trained the singers there. He flourished in the early 800s when the drive to consolidate and to extend what is often called the Carolingian Renaissance under Charlemagne was at its height. I've always found the Carolingian Renaissance a deeply moving notion. After all, this is perhaps the first time in Western history when the exalted powers of government occupied themselves with the lowliest techniques of literacy. Good spelling, accurate copying, clear handwriting. Those are the things that counted to Charlemagne in his educational reform, which, of course, he entrusted to an Englishman, Alcuin of York. One of the tasks facing the Carolingians and their servants was to clarify the terms of the religious life, to define things. What is a cleric? How should a cleric live? What is a monk? How should a monk live? The last of those questions is the one posed by our cantor, Grimlike, in a guide to the monastic life that he compiled called A Rule for Solitaries. This is what he has to say on the matter of chant. Childish games and laughter do not delight us, but rather holy readings and the spiritual music of melody instead. However hard-hearted we are and unable to produce tears, our hearts are turned to compunction when we hear the sweetness of chant. There are many so moved by chant to bewail their sins that they are readily brought to tears by the sweet sounds of a singer. Well, now I turn for my second text, perhaps rather unexpectedly, to Berlioz. In a collection of reminiscences called Nights in the Orchestra, Berlioz describes how he conducted a performance of Gluck's opera, Iphigenie en Tauride. When it came to the aria, O malheureuse Iphigenie, O unfortunate Iphigenie, a setting which Berlioz admired for what he calls its antique hue, so evocative of the simple, heroic grandeur of Homer. When, he, when it came to that moment, one of the players named Cosino simply gave up the struggle with his own feelings. According to Berlioz, I quote, when Iphigenie reached the aria, O malheureuse Iphigenie, Cosino, growing pale, ceased playing. He rested his elbows on his knees and hid his face in his hands, like one engulfed by an inexpressible feeling. Two streams of tears burst violently from his eyes, and he wept so hard that I was compelled to take him out of the hall. Berlioz, as you can see, is really very specific about the music that induced the tearful reaction that he observed. The sense of a composer, in this case Gluck, as the fountainhead of music, and of its emotional effects could hardly be stronger, could it? He believes he can explain the musician's reaction in terms of qualities in the score and the story recounted in the opera. But he can't say, it seems to me, I'll have your view at the end, he can't say 
what the experience actually means in terms of its moral consequence or spur to future action. The tears of the player, who simply cannot cope anymore, so much does he feel, clearly sustain the romantic notion of artistic genius as an overwhelming force, something of which, of course, Berlioz was deeply committed to as a notion, especially his own genius, quite fairly and properly. But there seems to be no social convention in that passage for regulating what should happen when an unusually emphatic form of surrender to tears actually takes place, a tearful collapse. As a result, Berlioz really can't do anything except lead the man away. Our Frankish cantor, in contrast, is referring not to a specific chant, but in general terms to the entire repertoire of plain song for the liturgical year, what he calls a spiritual music of melody, which seems to pervade all genres of chant at once. Far from being an encumbrance to proceedings, a singer in Grimlike's world who reacted tearfully would enhance his connections with others, would validate the whole process of worship, and find his importance to the common project of being there singing validated, magnified, and would know that his condition had a name, compunction, in this veil of tears. Listen to the Salve Regina, if you will, one more time. is singing that? Well, the simple answer is, of course, that it's Chris Watson. But it seems to be, doesn't it, all the faithful. Mary is our sweetness, our hope, we, the poor banished children of Eve. This is every man singing, every woman singing, all of us. When someone sings it, as Chris just has, they sing it for themselves, they sing it for us, they sing it to us, they sing it almost through us. 
But in Rex Altem David, it was very much one person. O Absalom, my son, O my son, who may grant me that I may die for thee, O my son? As some of you may know, in recent years, psychologists of music have proposed a really very interesting theory that music often moves us by evoking a nebulous human subject whose inner life is somehow happening in the music for us to experience in a uniquely intimate way. One of them has called this, I quote, the thesis that in hearing music, we sometimes imagine a person who is subject to a narrative unfolding in the musical sound. Now, obviously, this sense of a person can be very much enhanced when the music functions in a narrative context or when it carries a text that voices the thoughts of a participant in one. In a famous study, the ethnologist Jean Briggs reveals how she spent a long period with the Uktu tribe of Eskimos and found that her principal informant, called Inutiak, became deeply attached to Verdi's opera Il Trovatore when she played it to him. He never heard it before, and he described it as, I quote her reporting his words, it's music that makes you want to cry. Well, I don't know whether that demonstrates the universality of the musical values embodied in romantic opera, and in fact, I'd rather not believe that for complex reasons. But I suspect that Briggs told the story of tragic love and death that lies behind the facade of that great work. He filtered his perception through that narrative screen. Now, the great majority of medieval plain songs have words drawn or adapted from the Bible, and scripture, of course, is often narrative, as in many books of the Old Testament, or it's dramatic in the strict sense that people are speaking often with great vehemence. There are impassioned soliloquies and many passages which confront the most exalted and the most abased feelings associated with King David. So intensely visualized, of course, as he is in medieval painting and sculpture. Remember that a monastic or clerical singer of the Middle Ages helped King David bear his soul 150 times a week by singing the 150 psalms in the course of seven days. Through an identification with the plight of David, the psalms became the monks, the nuns' own prayers. This is as clear as day in one of the earliest monastic writers, John Cassian, from the fourth century in Marseille. He says, a monk should take into himself all the disposition of the psalms. He will begin to repeat them and to treat them in the profound compunction of heart, not as if they were composed by the prophet David, but as if they were his own utterances or prayers. So now perhaps here's a way of understanding or adding to our understanding of what John meant when he said Rex Altem David seems to give sound to lamentation. O oh, Absalom, my son, O oh, my son, Absalom. You can't hope to find David bearing his soul more candidly or intensely than that. Plain song was a repertoire of music with text embedded in a wealth of scriptural narrative, love, loss, and death. And I'm reminded just one last time of Gluck's opera, Iphigenie on Tauride, with its tragic lament sung by the heroine that had such a dramatic effect when Balios was conducting. Being moved by plain song in the Middle Ages often meant responding to the aria of a suffering character in the grand opera of the salvation history that we call the liturgy. Thank you very much.